Good afternoon, and welcome to the second edition of the Ohio State University's Driving Change webinar series, a dialogue and discussion format for our corporate and institutional partners focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion in institutions, places of work, and corporate America. I am Kurt Ely, Executive Director for Corporate Relations for The Ohio State University, and pleased to be with you. Questions today will be accepted using the Q&A function during the course of the webinar and requests for follow-up can be posted in this same manner. Future webinars are being planned in November and December to continue the conversation, so please be on the lookout for email invitations to those events. As, as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and will be available following today's event. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the host for this series, Dr. James Moore. James is Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer for The Ohio State University. In addition, Dr. Moore co-chairs the university's task force on racism and racial inequities. Dr. Moore is an internationally recognized researcher focusing on school counseling, gifted education, and higher education, multicultural education, and counseling in STEM education. Dr. Moore, the program is yours. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kurt. It is always a pleasure and honor to work with you and your fabulous team. I'm very excited about our monthly corporate equity and justice webinar, which we kicked off last month. This new series is timely as ODI celebrates its 50th anniversary. Throughout the year, we have a number of events scheduled. I encourage you to peruse our website to learn about these events, as well as other major diversity, equity, and inclusion activities in ODI and across the campus. You can check us out on, via our website, www.osu.edu odi.edu. For half a century, ODI has been a pioneer in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are one of the nation's oldest, most comprehensive, and most impactful offers of its kind in the nation. Long before it became fashionable, we had a deep and abiding belief that inclusion had merit and diversity brought us strength and inclusion. ODI has a storied history at OSU and has helped to make OSU a leader in higher education in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Someday, I truly hope that the ideas of diversity inclusion are so integrated in our institution that someday we will no longer need such an office or even a position. When we think about work we do at ODI, I really see an essential part of our efforts is to connect opportunities and support mechanisms with the aspirations of our students, as well as create an apparatus for optimal su success for our scholars and the many faculty and staff who work closely with them. And that's really where our corporate partners can help the most. We're proud of a current relationship we have with JP Morgan Chase and Co. They, the gift that they recently gave us was the largest in the history of our office. And while the dollars they gave us are integral to, to helping us stretch our resources and the internship opportunities and the financial literacy seminars and the other ways we work together to help students succeed are just as important. Corporations are waking up to the fact that diversity and inclusion is not just about a workforce that reflects their customer base. It's about the fact that we make better decisions when everyone has a seat at the table. Now, as we kick off today's discussion with our esteemed panelists, I hope we'll get a chance to address lessons learned in the DNI space, but also about corporations and nonprofit, how corporations and nonprofits can build more equitable institutions. I hope we have a timely and thoughtful discussion about how companies can leverage their brands and resources to advance equity and inclusion for all. I'm joined today by Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Karen Ashley of American Electric Power, one of the great workforce inclusion leaders in the corporate sector, as, as well as two of our most beloved, of my most beloved mentees, 
Kyle McKinney, who graduated this past spring with a BS in Business Administration, and Shawina Hassini, a graduating senior studying food and biological engineering. By the way, both students were recipients of our flagship scholarship program, the Moral Scholarship. More extensive bios are in the briefings, and so I encourage our audience to review them uh, when they have time. Our now would like to begin the panel. I am excited to be here with you too. Uh, Shawina and Kyle. Kyle, you are current, currently in the workplace and you just recently accepted a position with LinkedIn in the Chicago area. Shawina, you are currently a graduating senior. You have one more year and you just recently accepted a big position at Pepsi Co. So tell me, uh, I'm sure the audience wants to know a little bit about your, you, yourself. How would you characterize your student experience at OSU? We'll start with Kyle first. Okay. Um, hello everyone. Uh, I would say in regards to my student experience, it was amazing to say the least. And why I say that is uh, having the opportunity to be at Ohio State, I was a part of a multitude of different things. So um, beyond just being a student, I was also a student athlete. And so I was heavily involved with the athletic department at Ohio State. And I think one thing that really shaped my experience was having the opportunity to be a student athlete and then being a business student as well. Um, the Fisher College of Business really allowed me to cultivate not only as a young professional, but as a leader. And there were so many different resources and opportunities that I was presented with all throughout my journey. Thank you. Why did you select OSU? A lot of it was uh, actually because of my sister. So my <laughs> sister is a, she's an alum of uh, Ohio State and I was, you know, you're kind of, you're in high school and you're trying to, like, you're trying to kind of cultivate your own identity. You're like, oh, I kind of want to, you know, go my own path and, you know, just see what I can do. But then I, I was sold because, you know, when she, seeing what she had done at Ohio State and also as a student athlete as well, I, I saw it as just a really good opportunity for myself and being able to still make my own path at the same institution. I saw that in my future as well. And she really, I said she was a really huge reason why I ended up choosing Ohio State and um, seeing her success as well. Oh, Shawina. So to be honest, when I first came to the school here, it was, it was a little bit difficult. I mean, I was adjusting from, I was, I was in a different place. I was in a completely different country and it was more, I was more so inside of my shell. But over the years, uh, I got the opportunity in my third year, actually my junior year to to work as a resident advisor, to work building communities in Ohio State University. That's where I actually found my, a little bit of my passion. So that's what, that's something I'd, I'd mention, I'd like to mention and say how it, it, my, my, my progression through, this, through the school years was very, was, 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 was steady. So initially I came in very new, didn't know anybody. And then eventually I, I made, made new friends. And then eventually I got a job on campus. So all those different aspects has contributed to the fact that it contributed to the, ex the extraordinary student experience that I, was, that I received here at Ohio State University. And now with the graduating, with me graduating this, at least during this year, I'll have the opportunity to hopefully work for the company that, that's, that'll help grow, grow me in, in other aspects. So that's a little bit of, about me and uh, my student experience here at Ohio State University. And why did you select OSU? You had lots of options, just like Kyle, but why OSU? That's a good question. Uh, I'd say ODI. ODI, with their, with, they had a really good uh, program, specifically the Moral Scholar program. And when I applied to several, I applied to several universities, but specifically uh, there, and, and in each application, there are supplemental um, essays. There was a specific supplemental essay for the Ohio State um, application that dealt with diversity and inclusion. And I ended up answering that prompt, and that prompt landed me getting, a fun, getting funding here at Ohio State. So if it wasn't for me answering that one prompt and, and talking about diversity and, and talking about what diversity means to me, I doubt I would have, I would have ever been at Ohio State University. Thank you. Yeah. Karen, you have a big job at AEP. So tell us a little bit about the work you, you're engaged in at AEP. 
Sure. So first of all, let me say thank you um, for inviting me to the discussion. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be a part of this panel uh, with such esteemed guests. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation um, and what you know I will learn um, even as a chief diversity officer. You know, we talk about the work of diversity and inclusion, Dr. Moore. I'm sure you 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 can resonate with with this is that this work that we do is a journey, right? That we learn every day more and more about ourselves um, and about this work. So thank you for the opportunity to participate. And so let me say that um, at AEP, uh, we are committed to a culture um, where differences are valued and recognized as a significant um, positive influence on our ability to serve and support our employees, our customers, our suppliers, um, and other key stakeholders. We have a specific way at AEP that we talk about diversity and inclusion. I'm sure you all will find that every organization um, defines the two words diversity and inclusion um, differently. Um, but for us at AEP, we like to talk about diversity in terms of the boundless range of not only the differences that we have, uh, but also the similarities that are represented by all of our employees, customers, suppliers, and key stakeholders. And then in terms of inclusion, um, we recognize that inclusion doesn't just happen, but that we have to be intentional about making sure that we have a workforce um, of employees who, um, feel as though they belong and that they um, are definitely included and that their voice matters, that their skills and their talents um, matter to us. So I wanted to just make sure that everyone knows that uh, at AEP, we're definitely uh, committed to the work of diversity and inclusion. So I will tell you that um, in terms of the work that we have going on, and I'll try to highlight maybe just a few of the initiatives that we have going on right now. Um, in July, or in June, I'm sorry, we launched um, a Seize the Moment action plan. And it's our internal response to the nationwide call for racial um, equality and justice. And we have a number of initiatives that we're implementing um, through the end of the year um, as a result of our Seize the Moment an action plan. So we're having monthly town hall discussions. Um, our CEO, Mr. Nick Akins, um, um, conducted the first town hall um, in June where uh, we, he and I had a very candid conversation about race um, and racism in the workplace. Um, and it was just a really good, robust, candid conversation. Um, in July, we brought a guest speaker in, Tim Wise. Some of you all may be familiar with him. Um, Tim, um, you know, an anti-racist activist, um, subject matter expert in the topic, um, came and spoke with us um, just about racism, history of it, um, and then some things that we can do um, as a corporation. Um, in terms of reviewing our policies, reviewing our procedures, um, just things along those lines uh, to make sure that we have airtight practices and procedures in place um, that are not perpetuating unintentionally uh, systemic racism. Um, and, and Tim also spoke with our top 250 leaders of the company. Then we also had a session with the top 20 African-American leaders um, at AEP. Um, we've had uh, a couple of more town hall sessions just last week. Um, I had a panel of employees. We came together and we talked about um, diversity in marriage um, and how that plays out um, even in the workplace. Um, and we, you know, we'll have a few more uh, town hall sessions throughout the um, throughout the, the rest of the year. So we're doing a lot. Um, we've implemented a diversity and inclusion strategic plan. We're, we um, refer to it as the roadmap to 2025, uh, where we have four focus areas. Uh, we're looking to build a diverse workforce. 
um, and we want to make sure that we have an inclusive workforce as well. Um, we're putting um, leadership accountability measures in place. We want to make sure, you know, our third focus area around leadership accountability and sustainability that um, this work that we do is not just flavor of the month. So we want to make sure that we have initiatives in place that are sustainable. And then of course, our last uh, focus area tied to our strategic plan um, is around external partnerships, making sure that the communities that we serve, that our customers, that our suppliers, um, other key stakeholders recognize that outside of the walls of AEP, it is something that we are committed to. So those are the four pillars of our uh, DNI strategy. So let me stop right there, Dr. Moore. I think that should give uh, the audience a little bit of an overview, a snapshot of, of the work that we're doing um, at AEP around diversity and inclusion. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, just a follow-up question. Can you talk a little bit about how AEP has collaborated with higher education around diversity, equity, inclusion uh, goals that they have? Sure, sure. So um, our, specifically our transmission organization has a very robust uh, co-op and internship program, um, if you will, and it has been in place upwards of 15 years. Um, so we've really had an opportunity um, to, to get really good um, at making sure that we partner uh, with colleges and universities um, within and outside of our footprint um, to provide students with an opportunity to spend time with us, um, whether it be over the summer months um, or even just throughout the, um, the academic year uh, where we provide the students an opportunity to come in and take on real work. Right, so we, we will make assignments on projects. Um, we provide the students an opportunity um, to um, have speaking engagements, to present um, sometimes to senior level executives um, and other leaders. So we try to make sure that the time that um, our students spend with us is valuable. Um, and that it's a true learning experience, you know, in terms of real life um, working experience, I guess, if you will. You know, it's one thing um, to study about being in an organization um, or to be an employee. It's another thing to actually be entrenched in the work and to see the inner workings, um, to learn how to maneuver if you will, um, some of the political channels, those are things that we are not taught in school. Um, and so I think it's very important that as, as we bring students on, we make sure that we assign them mentors, mentors that will help them navigate, you know, some of the, some of the channels and, and you know, really kind of learn some of the unwritten rules, I guess, if you will, um, so that they, uh, will walk away with a really good experience um, and not be surprised when they find themselves um, in a workplace setting. Thank you. I just want uh, the audience to, if you have any questions, please direct your questions to the Q&A function. Uh, we will entertain those questions with the panelists. I want to come back to Shawina. Shawina, you came you lived in a totally different country and you came to OSU. So it's clear that you did your homework mm -hmm. uh, and you discovered the Moral Scholarship Program. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how significant was that scholarship in your experience at OSU beyond just financially? How significant has that scholarship been for you? It's been, well, academically, I'd say it's been extremely um, you have to focus. I mean, it's it's good because it's a good opportunity. Not everyone, not everyone's given that opportunity. You have to really, you have to very much double down on what's important to you. You have to cut out any extraneous, um, any extraneous activity that is, is causing that that's bringing you down. Um, I'd say that's how it's that's how it's affected me. I'd have to I have to put in a lot of focus in my in my academics just because 
there's a certain there's a certain how do you say it, a certain GPA that you must that you must keep 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 maintained, and so for certain majors, not every major is the same. Not every major is, is made equal. Some majors are more difficult difficult than other majors. So my major specifically, my food and biological engineering, has is a cha it's, it's challenging. It's not like and it's not something that's it's not something that's easily done. So I'd say in terms of how it impacted me, I'd say I'd, I had to I had to focus. I had to focus, get, double down on what, what matters to me, what experiences I want to gain from the university, and how I want to press forward with trying to do, do best. Thank you. And, and Kyla, you re also received the Moral Scholarship Program, and how significant was it for you and your student experience at OSU? So um, I actually, I came in through um, EAP, through the BNRC, and I was not necessarily a moral scholar, but a lot of the ways I got involved was mainly through um, the BNRC. Yeah. And so using that and also the, the diversity and inclusion office at Fisher really helped me navigate through the spaces that um, were, I guess, in, inviting for me um, in such a large institution like Ohio State. And it was, it was really through the when I came in through the AAP program, I saw a lot of what the black male leadership that I was looking for was like at Ohio State. And that's one thing that really um, not only intrigued me, but it made me want to get involved um, further within the community. Well, tell us you're using these acronyms in higher ed. We do that frequently. We just assume oh, yeah. that everybody yeah. knows what yeah. these acronyms. Can you tell us what the BNRC means? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the Bell National Resource Center um, for the African American Male essentially it was created for the advancement for black male students and uh, for incoming students like myself when I was a freshman um, way back when. Uh, and so uh, it was the early arrival program essentially was uh, a, just uh, pretty much a introduction to what campus life would be like. And it allowed me to be a part of a cohort of other incoming black male freshmen who wanted to learn about how to really navigate through Ohio State and um, really presenting them the resources that they could use to make their experience much more impactful. Well, you're a former student and alum, and um, we're very proud of you. You've got an a, a, a outstanding job, and hopefully uh, the pandemic will allow you to finally move to Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> but what did you look for? This is from the audience. What did you look for yeah. in a company relative to their diversity, equity, and inclusion environment slash programs, and how much of a factor did it play in your decision or opportunity around employment? That's a really great question. Um, so I also want to highlight that the position that I was offered at LinkedIn, I would say a lot of it, I, if not all of it, was I owe all of it to God also, but um, to just MLT, Management Leadership for Tomorrow. And that was a, that's a diversity initiative program that was created to help students from backgrounds like my, who identify as African-American or Black, um, Latinx or Native American. And cause we are the most underrepresented in the business industry or the in the corporate world. And so it was a fellowship that I applied to around my, it was my junior year actually. And one thing that, um, really helped me in that program was the mentoring and the coaching that I got. And from that fellowship, I was able to, um, I was introduced to LinkedIn and honestly, I didn't really know a lot about LinkedIn. I knew that I had one and I knew that I needed to continue, continuously improve it, but I would have never thought that I would have actually been working, you know, for LinkedIn. And so I, I going to seminars and going to different workshops and learning about, um, from the employees of what they do there, I got, I was more attracted to it, but also seeing the people who, um, seeing people who look like me in, in places that were so large, like this company. And when I actually got there, when I was a intern this past summer, one thing that really stood out to me was we held a Juneteenth program. And I would have never thought out of any of just the Fortune 500 companies that Juneteenth would have been, would have held such a, a large significance for some of these companies. And they asked me, it, it just an intern, they were like, uh, we want you to uh, co-lead it. And I was like, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and so it was kind of last minute for me because I, um, it, it, now that it was a bad thing, but it was just like, I, I was, 
my other former intern was taking the lead on it. And then she talked with um, some of the, I guess some of our mentors and they were saying, no, you should have Kyle do it with you. And it's like, okay, cool. So I, I felt good that I knew about Juneteenth, but when I actually did the program and when I was speaking on it and presenting it, there were so many, um, so many, I was really astounded and surprised at how many faces came out that, that were not just black faces and they were, or they were not um, black people. And so it was like, wow, it was really interesting just to see the really, I guess like the interest from people wanting to learn more about my culture. And that was, I think that's where I truly felt inclusion, you know, a part of the company, which made me want to, to see what more they had to offer. And that, was a, a I'd say a, a pretty big factor on why I decided to return a full time at LinkedIn. So, well, thank you for sharing that, Karen. Uh, this is a question that came from the audience, and what candidate fee what candid feedback have you received that has impacted your philosophy and approach to deploying a diverse and inclusive work environment and related policies? What candid feedback have you received that has impacted your philosophy and approach to deploying a diverse and inclusive work environment? Oh, wow. That, um, that, that is a great question because there's been a lot of candid feedback <laughs> about, about this work. But uh, I will tell you that um, uh, upon landing uh, in this role at AEP, um, a few months uh, into, into the role, I um, hit the road and conducted a listening tour and spoke with uh, over 700 um, of our employees across our entire footprint, you know, which spans uh, upwards of seven states, of course. And so, you know, it was, it was literally like a tour, right? Except I didn't have the tour bus didn't have someone doing my makeup and my hair every day, right? <laughs> it was me driving around to all of our different <coughs> locations. And um, I, I intentionally selected locations that were not just in metropolitan AEP footprint uh, areas, but uh, I intentionally visited, visited some of our rural um, locations and facilities. And um, again, just for context setting, um, I also asked, you know, once I determined the locations, um, I asked our um, Human Resources Information Systems Department to give me a list of 25 employees uh, that mirrored the workforce at each one of the locations. So I will tell you, in some of the locations that I visited, I had a very diverse group of employees um, who I spoke with, and there was one one particular listening to a session where it was me um, and a group of all white male employees. And um, of course, you know, there was a little bit of concern uh, and trepidation in starting the conversation. But after our 90 minutes together, it was probably one of the best sessions that I had. Um, and the candid feedback that I received in that particular session was that, um, and I'll, I'll share just a few, few bullet points. One um, is that this work definitely needs to be about all of our employees, um, that our white male employees cannot be forgotten about, um, but that we have to make sure um, that they are brought into our efforts around diversity and inclusion um, and that we hear their voices as well. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I appreciated that feedback because uh, white males make up the majority of our workforce. You know, and I tell people all the time, we will not be successful if we leave any portion, right? Or any, any demographic of our workforce out of the work that we're looking to do. So that's one piece of candid feedback that resonated with me. Um, the other piece of feedback that I heard um, during this listening tour is that the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion can be, and you heard me say this a little bit earlier, flavor of the month. That, um, you know, a racial uprising happens, protests start, companies talk about it, 
um, and really, really engage um, and focus on changing things. Um, and then a year, two years down the road, there's silence. So that the feedback that I heard is this work cannot be flavor of the month. Um, employees told me point blank, Karen, you know, uh, we've heard these conversations before. We've seen this work launched before it comes and it goes. So um, that said to me that we need to make sure that at AEP, we have a sustainable effort that is not just something that we do for three years and that we stop, but that we have to constantly, constantly um, visit our strategy, um, check and adjust as necessary. We have to make sure that we keep communications flowing. Um, of course, we don't want diversity, equity, and inclusion fatigue, but we have to do just enough to make sure um, that it remains a priority and that it stays at the forefront and that we don't lose sight of the great work, you know, and the foundation that's been built. Thank you. You know, um, probably in our own respective, uh, through our own respective experiences, uh, many of us are probably went into sectors or domains in which it doesn't reflect necessarily our identities and our experiences. Uh, Shawina, I know you're in a field that oftentimes people would say is not so diverse in terms of racial diversity. Mm -hmm. And so, so tell us what are some of the things you think could enhance your experience if your major was more diverse? Because I think it's important for people who are uh, participating in the Zoom to hear how meaningful these kinds of things, having a diverse and inclusive set of peers and, you know, and a, being in a, not saying it's not, but I'm just saying, how important is that to you? to be in a place where uh, people don't necessarily question your capability, they automatically assume that you can be successful and, there be, and the environment is inviting. How important is that being in a space like that is to you? It's very, uh, I'd say specifically, um, I'd say it's very, it's very important. Um, it's very important to me personally. I mean, I've had I have had, so I've, ex, I've interned uh, at two companies actually. So I've interned at, at PepsiCo this past summer and I interned at a different company the summer before that. And uh, this, that specific company had plants all over the US. But uh, that specific plant that I worked in was, was very, it lacked diversity. And this is just me being honest. They lacked diversity. They didn't have many people that looked like me. And that, that made an impact. I completely, I very much remember how walk, walking through the hallways and not, maybe not getting a hello or not saying, getting, getting saying it instead of hello or not being welcomed just because I looked a little bit, little bit different. And it forces you to just, it forces you to get, to get, to have a shell and to close in and you can't, and it, and it kind of prevents you from being creative sometimes and prevents you from speaking your opinions just because you don't have people around you that look the same, look the same like you. So I think it's important because if you want people to excel they need them to be able to be themselves, come be themselves at work. If you can't be yourself at work, then you're very much so. You're not bringing your full. You're not bringing your full. Your full. Uh, all your tools to the table, basically. So I'd say, for me personally, um, having a diverse workforce allows you to be yourself at work. If you have, if, if there are people from, if there are people uh, coming to, if there are people coming to that workplace not being themselves, then they can't produce the work that produce valuable work that's needed in the workplace. So that's something that I'd say, at least personally for me, I've had experiences where there was a lot of diversity and I've had experiences where there wasn't that much diversity. And I can see just how myself personally, I, I reacted to that. Yeah, Cal, do you have any reactions or experiences that you would like to share in relation to that question? I would say that I found a lot of that through my classes uh, as a student. Uh, there were some times I would be the only black male in um, my class and it at the times it was it, it's kind of it can be kind of weird because you know you you want to be heard and you want to well you want to be seen and you also want to be heard but it's 
a lot of times that can really replicate what it's like in the corporate world too. So I think that eventually when I started to, when I was around spaces where more people look like me, I felt, um, uh, I felt a greater sense of confidence of just being in those spaces where I was the only person who looked like me. But, um, and even seeing that over the summer a little bit too, I think the thing that, that did help my experience when it came to being an intern was the employee resource groups and creating that space for employees so they can um, talk, not, not, I wouldn't say necessarily like separating themselves, but just having a space where they feel like they can uh, talk about issues that affect their community and invite others to learn about those issues as well. And I think that LinkedIn in particular did, did a really great job of the employee resource groups that they had for all the different communities that were part of their company. But definitely trying to feel where you fit in um, coming from a diverse background. I have definitely felt that um, not only in school, but in on my corporate experience too. Uh, as a result of the George Floyd, as, as well as many other um, challenges we've had in the larger society and, and it's kind of it's kind of uh, seeped, seeped in other arenas of, of our society, higher education, the corporate sector, and all of these different social institutions uh, responding accordingly. And I heard Karen, AEP, AEP is no different from any other social institution in America is being responsive and you're your company is bringing in speakers and doing training, you know, what message would you give to those? And this is the message that I get sitting in this seat that it's gonna be any different from any other time period where we sort of like we go through these cycles and society becomes more conscientious, but ultimately we seemingly get lags and we, we, we go back to where we were. Um, what, what, what affirmations, what evidence or preliminary evidence that you have that AEP is really gonna transform itself uh, for prospective uh, employees like Shawina and Kyle who are very talented going to get a degree in, in Kyle's case he's already completed his degree and Shawina will have his degree in, in, in summer from a top 25 university uh, they have lots of options but what is it that you can appeal to students like or, or former students like you know Kyle and, and a current student like Shawina sure sure so you know, I, I will, will say that, um, and, it's, and it's a great question, um, that one of the things that I've seen um, this time around, right? Um, and so I may uh, give up a little bit of my age here and that th this is not the first time, right? That, that I've seen this happen um, around our country. Um, but, but I will say one of the things that gives me so much encouragement um, and what I'm seeing at AEP um, is the fact that the excitement, the momentum, the desire to engage is coming from people who do not look like the four of us. Um, we have, um, I guess if you will, we, we've been beating the, the, the drum, right? We've been delivering the messages um, for decades. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm seeing now is even, even the initiative that our non-minority employees are taking um, and not waiting for me to reach out to them to ask to be um, on a panel discussion. Um, uh, not waiting for me to reach out to extend an invitation to serve um, as an extension of my team as a diversity and inclusion liaison um, in sending me email messages, text messages, 
of ideas and suggestions and recommendations of things that we can do at AEP. Um, raising their hand to say, I want to help, what can I do, Karen? Um, that is the level of hope um, that I have, if we can say this time around, um, that I have not seen in the past. And um, while it's unfortunate that we're in the midst of this pandemic um, that just doesn't seem to want to go away, um, on the flip side to that, you know, during the, during the early phases of the pandemic, we were all forced, right, all forced to stay home um, and pretty much be glued to the television um, or to our social media sites. And so, you know, it, it, it was almost as if we could not um, ignore what was happening with George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, um, the Central Park situation. Um, and that I believe just ushered in this awakening, this awakening um, that we cannot have our head, our heads in the sand anymore, is that this is an issue in this country that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and that, that it's okay, that it's okay that we just, we have to continue having conversations such as this. Um, and as we do, and I'll end with this, Dr. Moore. Um, it's amazing when we have conversations and forums like this, how we discover back to our definition at AEP um, that yes, we're different, but that we, we also have a lot in common. Um, and if we can get to a place where we can build on our similarities and kind of let, just let our differences be the icing on the cake, um, I think that's where we want to be. But, but those are, uh, are the things that, that give me hope um, is that I'm seeing so much um, excitement and desire um, from, from our non-minority employees who wanna get involved and get engaged. And I, and I, I am so proud of, of them for their courage and willingness to step up and, and wanna be engaged and involved. Thank you. And you know this is another question from the audience. Um, we've made a we've discussed a lot about um, corporate sector as well as elements of higher education. And this is from one of the, this question is in relation to student organizations. Um, this individual said that they went to great lengths to try to diversify uh, in the membership of, of a specific student organization. Uh, Cal, and Shawina, what recommendations would you um, offer to this specific individual on diversifying this specific student organization? Not that you know everything about the student organization, what, what strategies would you recommend to get more uh, Latinx students or uh, LGBT, LGBTQ plus community or the African-American community or biracial or, or whether it's religious diversity. I mean, what, what sort of recommendations would you recommend to this individual? You got it. Oh, sorry, Shawina. Yeah, gotcha. so yeah I was gonna say, um, I think you have to be genuine. I think you definitely have to be genuine with your approach. I mean, if you're trying to appeal to a certain amount of students, I think you have to reach out to those students specifically or reach out to leaders. So, so there are many student organizations on campus and there's some that are more diverse than others. So reaching out to those student organizations that are already diverse and they have those leaders, maybe those leaders who are maybe Latinx or are black or are LGBTQ, re reaching out to those people and actually and being genuine with them, being okay and telling them the facts, look, my organization isn't 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 as diverse, and I'm trying to get more people to do that. What kind of programmings can I can I do that can appeal to uh, those type of students? So I think programming, as well as being genuine, is is is, is key in trying to get any, any 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 anyone on your team. I think that's the biggest the, the biggest way of doing. It. I mean, at least to me, I can speak from experience. Uh, I I didn't have to do that. I had to do that specifically where I, when I was an RA. I had to make programs for my, my entire floor was all um, all white males. Not, there was not one um, black male on my floor. So I had to find ways to appeal to them, appeal to them maybe through sports or through some sort of exam, some sort of 
uh, tool that can get them to come to my programs, to get them to come, come, come and come and sit down and, and be together. So I think being genuine is extremely important. Uh, you have to be genuine with with with, with, the, with whoever you're trying to appeal to, and and being authentic. Thank you, Cal. Yeah, and, and echoing off of what Shuina said, um, definitely being genuine, but also um, well, in addition to that, showing up too. Um, I love how Shuina mentioned how when you're reaching out to leaders who have more resources um, for the uh, different communities, whether it's based on race or uh, religious background or um, uh, LGBTQ, you know, and, and, and more. I think that when you find those leaders who are, um, who have the, the resources for those communities, that's when you start building that connection. But I, I also say in addition to that, just showing up, you know, it, it can be a matter of there's maybe a large event on campus that is in support of something that's going on in the black community or the Latinx community. It's like, you know, um, maybe like show up. And, and, and I know that um, for some people, it's kind of like, you know, how, like how do you make yourself seen there? Um, I would say if there's someone, if you've started developing that relationship with maybe um, that leader from that uh, diverse organization, you could probably ask them if maybe they, they'd like to, you could accompany them to the program or, you know, just because I think when, when people see um, different faces and um, I guess like in, in, in spaces where they're used to seeing, I guess, like uh, a certain type of person or whatever it may be, it's, it's like, oh, like, I wonder, you know, what is, um, I, like, let's, like, let's learn about like where they're from or what they're doing and, you know, like maybe kind of share our community with them, you know, because when you show up to places, um, a lot of times it's, it's noticeable and it, and it can be noticeable in a very positive way. So I would say that making sure that you're intentional and genuine when you show up to those and just establish, establishing that relationship from there on? You know, um, Karen, this question is specifically to you, directed at you from the audience. How does one overcome mental fatigue around diversity inclusion work? Wow, I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> you know, um, per personal care, personal care is is important. Um, so I I think I mean I would encourage everyone who's who's listening is to understand that one we we have to listen to um, our bodies. We have to listen to. Um, what our bodies are telling us, right? And, and a lot of times some indications will be, um, you know, when we find ourselves just so overwhelmed that we can't think straight, that we're making mistakes, that we're rushed, that we're always in this state of, of just, you know, moving too fast, um, tired, can't sleep. That's an indication that it's time to step away, right? We have to give ourselves permission to step away. I think sometimes, you know, because we recognize in doing this work that there's so much work to do and we want to get it done, you know, yesterday. Uh, we have to understand and appreciate that it's a journey um, and that we don't want to burn ourselves out and become ineffective. So we have to learn how to just step away and to say it's okay. It will be there when I get back, you know, to have some hobbies, to have some interests outside of the work of diversity and inclusion. So, so that's one thing. The other thing um, in terms of, you know, just corporate uh, work environment organization fatigue, um, you know, I have these conversations quite a bit, um, is we don't want organizations to start looking at us, Dr. Moore, Time they see or see their names pop up, you know, the first response is, uh-oh, here we go again. It's something diversity and inclusion related, right? So we, we have to understand again that it's a journey, that we have to meet our companies, our organizations. Kyle, as you go into LinkedIn, that we have to meet our, our organizations, our workforces where they are. We have to know when to push and when to challenge, you know, and how to do that. But then we also have to recognize when, okay, we, again, we have to back off enough, uh, back up just a little bit, um, let some other initiatives play out, um, let people have a little bit of a breather, 
um, but yet make sure, you know, that we don't let too, too long of a time go by um, where we maybe have to bring the conversation back up or remind the organization of initiatives that we're looking to do. So um, it's, it can be a challenge to manage through all of that, especially, you know, dealing with an organization as large as AEP, you know, upwards of 17,000 employees spread across um, a number of states. Um, it, it's just kind of honing in on that wisdom and discernment, you know, and listening. Um, people will let you know when, um, when it's time to, to back up just a little bit. I mean, to respect that and to honor it um, and to just, you know, they just kind of back up for, for a little bit. So I, I, from a personal perspective, I think personal care is important. We have to give ourselves permission to step away. And then also in terms of the organizations and companies that we serve and support, we have to be in tune with them and listen and to know when uh, maybe we need to step back just a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully that answered um, the question. Uh, thank you. And I, I just want to give the audience a context, more information about the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I mentioned several of our signature activities within the office, but I just want to provide a little bit more depth and breadth around those things. The Moral Scholarship Program is nearly 1,500 students. The four-year, four five-year, six-year graduation rates higher than the university average. Uh, the, it covers the gamut from first generation to six generation college students. We have about a hundred students who are alums who are in graduate school. We have another hundred, about a hundred who are in uh, our professional schools. These students get top jobs like at, you know, PepsiCo or uh, Google, or AEP, or go to law school, Georgetown, or go to uh, the top graduate and professional schools in the country. The university in its storied uh, history. We've, I think we have had, what, eight uh, Rhodes Scholars, three, two out of the last three come out of the Moral Scholarship Program. So uh, it's very diverse and the students literally look like United Nations. Uh, you cannot pinpoint who the students are. Um, and so if, it is, if higher education is going to be a public good, I certainly like to believe that that's one of the entities on our campus that makes higher education a public good. Uh, Cal talked about the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on the African American Male, uh, arguably the most, the, the premier uh, programmatic and research center of this kind in America. Uh, we have a little over 1,300 undergraduate African American males on campus, and nearly 50% of them have a cumulative. Uh, 3.0 or better. And I would argue it's very few universities in the United States with those kind of numbers. And so we're very proud of that. Uh, we want people to see Ohio State as a place where you can get first talent and second, you can get diverse talent. And we're try trying to create an uh, apparatus for uh, various sectors to be able to access the talent that we have on our campus. As my mother would say, great minds come from every zip code. And uh, we like to believe that our work on our campus, the scale, our scale, our reach is unparalleled with most institutions. And so we're poised to take things to another level. But we like to believe in our office that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion starts and ends with collaboration. Uh, if we want to scale and have a greater greater impact, it's important that we establish partnerships with AEP and JP Morgan Chase and Honda and et cetera, et cetera. Um, those at the private sector, that's at the private sector, but we also think it's equally as important because our students are gonna be the future leaders and, and they will go in various sectors of our society. And so whether we're talking about in governmental nonprofit or community-based organizations. We like to think we have the talent to transform not only Columbus, um, Ohio, uh, other parts of the United States, because that's the kind of talent that we have. Literally um, tens of tens of plus, uh, probably over 50,000 students over the years, because we celebrate 50 years 
that have benefited in some way directly and indirectly for from our efforts. And so uh, we encourage people to go to our website. We have a range of resources available to individuals who want to learn more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as um, learn about different activities and events that we have scheduled um, that our office will be coordinating. And I would be remiss if I didn't highlight uh, um, uh, Nate's, this month is the LGBTQ plus month and we will be coordinating some activities. I encourage you to go to our website to see that last month was, I mean, this, we at the end of this, of the month of Latinx slash Hispanic month. And we had a range of different activities. This is our moment and we enjoy having each and every one of you on uh, this panel, our second panel, it was enriching. I'm sure our audience got a lot of nuggets that they can take with them. Um, but also I wanna remind the uh, audience uh, that we will be sending out an email that can be used to engage with us as well as follow up with us about anything that it, we're doing through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion as well as any other aspect of our beloved Ohio State University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>